Welcome to the next installment of our lectures. Uh, today we're going to be talking about experimental design. Uh, in fact, I'm going to break this up into a couple of different lectures. Uh, what we're going to do first is talk about what is an experiment, um, and that'll encompass this entire recording. A separate second recording then will be on basic experimental designs. That'll take a little while because there's a lot of different ways to go about this. You should think carefully about them, but we're really only skimming the surface. And then I'm going to come back again around to the design analysis relationship. Um, they should be thought of as a complete package. And if you approach your studies right up front with that in mind, things should work out better for you in the long run. All right, so why did I have this old guy's picture on here at the start of this? Well, this is Sir Ronald Fisher. Um, and when he's a much younger man, uh, the story goes that he had an argument with a lady about whether or not she could actually tell the difference between her tea having milk added before the tea was poured in or having added the milk after the tea was poured in. And he set up an experimental design and then analysis to test to see if she was correct. And in fact, the results show that she could tell the difference. So that beginning of statistical analysis in the 1800s um, was basically revolutionary for how we collect data on things like agriculture experiments, how to grow crops better, what kinds of fertilizer applications work best, which breeds are producing the highest yields, etc. has really, in fact you could argue part of the Green Revolution has been the um, strong robust statistical experimental designs that have been applied for over a century now to growing crops. So his work has really had a strong influence for a long time on how we conduct experiments and how we analyze them. A lot of the metaphors and um, basic designs have been from agriculture in fact. So let's get into what is an experiment. Well there's four basic conditions. One uh, conditions, um, features of def definitions for an experiment. Uh, there are carefully controlled conditions. Uh, you most simply, you have conditions that you have tried to standardize as best you can across all possible variants so that only the conditions of interest differ among experimental units. That would mean, for example, if I'm interested in the levels of fertilizer as being uh, what might cause more crop, I've tried to standardize everything else. The soils are the same in all of my plots. I use the same kind of corn. Everything I can think of I've tried to standardize except only that condition that I'm interested in. So you can imagine that a lot of experiments are best conducted if in uh, really controlled conditions. Those carefully controlled conditions like in a greenhouse mean that you have management capabilities over temperature and water stress, soils, drainage, light, all those things that would be really important to a plant, you can now manage by having uh, controlled and limited the range of variation that might occur in your experiment due to those factors that you don't really care about. For example, if I'm interested in growing strawberries like here, and I want to know what's the optimum level of fertilizer, I don't want to have to worry about temperature or, or watering capability, uh, water retention capability of the soils, things like that as the features that might also be affecting my strawberry growth. So I want to have these carefully controlled conditions. All right, in reality, you can't always work in a greenhouse, right? There are certain kinds of places, certain kinds of questions that require us to step outside of the greenhouse. You might need to think about this greenhouse as a somewhat artificial set of conditions then. You might actually need to think about how would you conduct an experiment outside of a greenhouse now it gets more complicated because remember we're talking about carefully controlled conditions being a major feature of what makes an experiment and as you might expect on a hill slope like this there are some conditions you just simply can't control for the best you might be able to do would try to account for them in your experimental design so already you might be able to see how experimental designs can be more and more complex once you get outside of a greenhouse or laboratory type setting for example, on that hill slope, I might need to think about just simply elevation or slope as a modifier of what I expect in an experiment. If I was going to set up plots, I might want to think about some down low, some at some medium heights, and some at some higher elevations because I expect drainage and slope and angle to the sun and all kinds of factors 
to be able to modify how much I might be able to grow on this field. So I wouldn't necessarily set up the rows as you see them in this. I might want to do them more perpendicular to the slope, sort of like terracing, if I was going to set up some plots, right? Okay, well let's step outside even further beyond this fairly manicured, manageable landscape to something that's much more wild. Now what we have is a prairie that has a slope gradient visible in the photograph and it's a completely natural setting. There's really no sort of manicuring or rearranging of spermal plots that are possible. If in this natural setting you wanted to throw down random plots and try to be able to census plant diversity, etc. in there, you might be able to say, okay, I'm going to do some at the high elevations and down the slopes, etc. But you're going to have to think carefully about that experimental design and try to account for all of those conditions you don't actually have control over. So as you might imagine, there's this spectrum here where you would think about the most carefully controlled conditions, like in a greenhouse, being your opportunity to conduct an early test of a hypothesis, a proof of concept idea. Um, so for instance, you want to try to work with a simple system, a single plant species, something that you can manage most carefully. And in fact, it might even be a con uh, set of experiments where you need to contain the system. You don't want that species to get out, or maybe, for example, don't want some other things to get in. So you're trying to really isolate and keep it as simple as possible and conduct an early test of your hypothesis. If you step outside, now you're talking perhaps about extending that hypothesis, the tested hypothesis, to the real world. You ran some experiments in the greenhouse. Yes, it looks like fertilizer makes plants grow, and so therefore you step outside to see what happens in the real world. You might have to try to account for some other effects and um, besides fertilizer, so for example pH and water, so maybe you're going to conduct a more complicated experiment out here in the real world where you're talking about multiple factors being combined together. And this also means now you're willing to be releasing your experiment into the real world in the literal sense in that you're planting your species out there, which is a worry of course if you're dealing with, dealing with an invasive species. But you also might want to think about that as letting go, releasing, your careful control to the real world because as soon as you conduct an experiment outside lots of other things can happen that can complicate your experiment or uh, negate the results you thought you'd expect to find. Okay let's go one step further up. Now you go outside into the full natural settings you're not long, no longer manicured and, and managing your plots as carefully. Now you have to try to account for all those contingencies that might occur. Storm damage, um, gophers eating your plants up, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, you need to try to uh, expect those things to happen and try to account for them statistically or even in your experimental design. So for example, if I'm worried about rabbits eating all of my plants, my strawberries, something in my plots, maybe I need to put fences up around them. And that might mean I need to put fences up around my controls in which strawberries are not present too. We'll get to those things in a minute. But the point is that you have to try to account for all these variabilities uh, that might be kicking in in your experiment. Okay, another possibility that would happen out here is now you're wanting to find out what other interactions among all those effects are expected. So here I might have thought about slope and fertilizer. Here I'm thinking about slope affecting fertilizer and maybe other factors that would kick in as well related to those. And what we're really doing at this point is we already expect to let go of everything in our previous experiments. We want to know how it really looks in the real world. We're letting go of, we're releasing all of our interest in trying to control these various factors that are ultimately under our control in the greenhouse. Now it's stepping out and letting it roll. So what we're really talking about here is this classic idea of a control versus realism trade-off. In the greenhouse you have perhaps the ultimate control over all the conditions you can possibly make. Outdoors in experimental plots it might be intermediate whereas simply sampling the real world is of course realistic but uncontrolled in that you didn't make treatments happen. You're evaluating the effect of slope and perhaps soil type and fertilization levels in the soils naturally on plant diversity etc. So this spectrum of greenhouse to experimental plots to real-world samples is something that we all play with all the time and so a fundamental question then is at what point on that spectrum do you need to be 
for your kinds of question. If your question is perhaps early, you want to test a hypothesis, proof of concept kinds of things, and you need to control conditions as carefully as possible, then maybe you're talking about a greenhouse type world. Whereas on the other hand, if you just want to go out and see what the real world looks like, and if it matches ideas that have already been developed from lots of careful experiments, then maybe you're doing the other end. Or what a lot of people have been finding themselves doing is the intermediate field experiments, which is this fairly positive, well you hope anyway, um, real control over settings, but uh, not necessarily as artificial as a greenhouse or a flask. So the idea with a lot of these intermediate level experiments that a lot of ecologists do is to try to maintain some of that control but be able to address criticisms about realism that might apply in a greenhouse. All right. So think carefully about where you need to be on that spectrum. And where that is will likely be a function of how far along understanding and the literature is in the, your topic. All right. So first off, we have to have carefully controlled conditions. That's a different term, and I'm trying to emphasize conditions in that first line, from controls. In this case, I mean experimental units where you have known conditions that are meant for comparison to treated units. So classic idea is that you know, you're in the control group and I guess um, thank goodness they're in the control group because these mice look pretty bad off. Or uh, as this young lady's trying to say in the car, uh, her sister is a member of the control group. She doesn't get to go on vacation. So control groups are, as conveyed by these two cartoons, the sets of units that are not going to be receiving a treatment. This is so you have a normal standard mode to compare to for treatments. You can evaluate how important a treatment might have been for your experiment. Okay, there's actually several different kinds of controls. Negative controls, where you do nothing, there's no treatment, that's related to a null hypothesis, which we'll come back to later, which is simply says that in the absence of doing anything, nothing happened. Okay? Um, and so if your experiment showed that the same as a null hypothesis, you'd say, well, guess what? My treatments didn't do anything. That's a negative control. The only way you know how to, do, how to uh, uh, say that your results showed nothing is to actually have a chance to observe nothing as well. So that means in this petri plate, you didn't put bacteria on there. You handled it all the same way. You opened it up. You did things with it. But in fact, you didn't get any sort of contamination on it. That would be your negative control. To compare, for example, to an experimental plate where you applied bacteria and they grew. Okay, So there's a treatment compared to a control where you didn't actually apply them. The only difference having been that you applied bacteria on the one on the right, you didn't apply it on the one on the left, use a sterile loop or something. Okay, There's another kind of control that w we know about if you think about medical kinds of terminology or behavioral trials. Uh, it's a placebo. It's a false treatment where you didn't actually make the treatment, but it, you made it look like a treatment had been applied. Um, turns out that it's not all that uncommon in medicine um, to prescribe sugar pills and things like that. A placebo can have a pretty powerful effect. This makes the most sense when you're talking about animal behavior. Uh, placebos being something that we can modify behavior with. I'll get into that a little bit further down the road here in a second. And finally, there's positive controls. A positive control is where I know I put in exactly what I'm supposed to put in. I better see a strong pattern there. And that would be knowing that I've got uh, the effect that should be there, obviously opposite the negative control, and then you can see what sort of uh, drug, for example, might have an effect on your bacteria that would be in between. So this shows that, yep, sure enough, I have the bacteria, it can grow on this plate. This shows that even though I handled the plate identically, when I don't put bacteria in, I don't get accidental contamination. So this is not a contamination effect in my treatment, for example. But I do get some sort of effect, and it is different from my positive control where I know exactly what should be there in an uninhibited conditions. Okay, So there's actually three kinds of controls in experiments. When we say control, for example, in this case, this is a negative control, right? The mice in this cage are actually saying we weren't treated. And in the case of uh, Nicole not getting to go on vacation, she would also be negative control. There's other kinds of controls, and just remember that. So let's think about placebos for a minute. If you're conducting an experiment in nature where you're playing around with predators and you're trying to exclude predators or uh, try to use that exclosure as a mechanism to try to evaluate how important predators might be, you need to use a cage. Okay, It's common with terrestrial experiments, 
classic work by James Brown um, in the desert they put up a great big fence uh, to ex to keep animals out and keep other animals in in this case it's being conducted on reef fishes in this cool paper by Mark Steele explaining how these things work um, this exclosure cage then is completely enclosing a, a reef area to try to keep out predators all right now that's obviously introducing a fairly artificial set of conditions on a reef you have to worry about the effects of that cage on your experiment. So there's another kind of cage control where it appears caged from the top but fish can actually pass through underneath and then there's another simple plot area that you might map out on the reef where there's no cage in fact. Okay, So there's this cage effect which is actually a placebo and if you look at the effects on reef fish you notice that it's really strong. Here are a couple of gobies that they worry about uh, on their effects, uh, the, the effects of predation on these fish on the reef. So uh, Lithripnus and Corfi... <laughs> Corfi... Uh, yeah, well, you, you can pronounce it. Um, this uh, two different species now showing the survivorship in the complete exclosure, keeping predators out. The uh, cage control, the one in the center here, with it's actually they're able to pass through, and when there's no cage, and so from you when you look at these graphs, you might infer that lithripness seems to do much better if you completely exclude predators and they can't even um, be allowed to pass through the bottom, whereas these two look very similar, the no, the cage control and the no cage, which means that lithripness seems to be vulnerable to predators which can actually pass through underneath and they're not excluded by the mesh on the top. Okay, That pattern looks fairly different from Corifopterus. How's that one? Corifopterus? Okay. Where the exclosure and the cage control are now quite similar to each other and oh no cage is the only one where we see a decrease in survivorship. Ah, so it would appear that these two different fishes are vulnerable to different predators or the predators that specialize perhaps on these two different gobies are behaving differently in response to the cages. So you see how a cage can really modify the effects you see in a different experiment. And you'd have to think about this carefully. If you're doing just one cage for both of these kinds of fishes, you might see if a, you might infer something incorrect. So let's look at the predators. Paralabrix, which is I think the large grouper here, um, the number of predators within one meter of their reef, the reef being these little artificial systems they set up, again the same cages, and notice that you get the number of predators is pretty high around the exclosure cage, okay, and it's fairly low around these other cages. So the number of predators being fairly high around that cage with one, within one meter of that area, but yet they have high survivorship. So there's a high number of those fish surviving inside the cage. These predators would appear to know that. Even though they're fairly high abundance, they're not able to prey on those. And then other potential predators, shown here by the sea monster, look like a fairly consistent pattern with that as well, where there seems to be a higher number in the exclosure, or in and around the exclosure cages. But in fact, that's not statistically different, as noted by the little A signs above all these. These are not actually different because of a fair amount of variation across these. These two are different, A versus the Bs in the top. Okay, So the predators responded differently to these cages and those cages made a difference especially for Lithripnus. Having some sort of exclosure here meant that Corifopterus uh, was able to um, survive better even in this topmost cage despite no obvious effect on other potential predators. So there's something going on with Corifopterus and other predators, it would appear. Okay, So the cage effect has a big difference on the results and your interpretations of results. That placebo, that modification of behavior, then turns out to be pretty important in animal type experiments. Okay, okay a f third part of experiments is replication. You need to think carefully about how many replicates you're going to need. There is, I'll tell you right now, a trade-off with having lots of replicates can be a really hard experiment, but you need to have enough replicates so you've captured the variation. So there's this balancing act between having not enough and too many replicates. Not enough being you didn't study the patterns well enough, too many being you did way more work than you needed to. Okay, So replication 
is important because you have independent units where the treatments are identical in each of your experimental units and that way you're finding out if your experiment just happened to be a fluke or not if you can get the same result repeatedly separately in different places different flasks different plots different places then you can be more assured that it's a real effect that's the whole point of replication a very important part of experiments okay so what is replication well, as you might expect, it's just separate units, separate pots with flowers in them, separate baskets with clams in them they are going to be hung in the water. There's these different kinds of experiments that are done in lots of different places, and replication is a fundamental commonality across all these experiments. And you might have treatments where you have to apply different amounts of water. Here's 0.1 liters, 0.5, and 1 liter per day into different pots. You have a separate replicate of each of those sets of treatments okay that's a pretty straightforward concept <laughs> of course it's not often implemented fully and that's why we need to talk about this so the big question is how many are enough the standard rule is you're gonna have to have three um, to get a, an actual measurement of average but that really is a minimum what you're wanting to do is try to calculate what the average might be give or take some number of standard deviations or confidence intervals which we'll be talking about a lot this semester the idea is that an average is only half a story you're going to need to try to express the variation around that average and the minimum really is about three but minimum hopefully being uh, not something you aim for when you conduct research you're going to need to think about how many can you get away with and that's the balancing act between practical logistics and having some sort of statistical validity to your studies okay so the maximum is going to depend a lot on your system and how well you can pull off more all right how do you know this you're going to have to learn a lot about your system first you're going to have to learn about how variable it is in advance of actually having done the study for real which means you probably need to do some preliminary experiments preliminary experiments are something we don't often take enough time for but if you can do those preliminary experiments you can conduct what's called a power analysis which we'll also get to later in the semester and then that can tell you how many replicates might you might need imagine for instance where you're in a study system that is quite variable the more variable it is the more replicates you need if you went out and conducted an experiment with three replicates you go through all that work and then you find out you can't say you see anything because the system's so variable then you would have spent all that time and effort unfortunately not able to say anything if you'd had more replicates and a power analysis tells you how many might be enough you might have been able to detect an effect so preliminary experiments in a power analysis are the way to answer how many are enough for the study system in which you're working your preliminary experiments need to be somewhat matched to your final experiments and that means you need to have thought through those as well okay so this is actually a pretty big challenge in front of us to try to figure out how many replicates are enough it's not that easy but it's really important if you don't want to waste all your time and effort okay fourth major condition of an experiment is randomization experimental units need to be assigned to treatments randomly so that you aren't already biasing your results imagine our greenhouse where you have plants and you're growing them with different fertilizer treatments if you used a couple different kinds of potting soil for instance you want to be careful that you assign assign your different fertilizers to those different bags randomly so that you don't have all the low fertilizer treatments happening to be in one kind of potting soil because obviously that would confuse you you don't know if your growth differences are due to the potting soil or the fertilizer so you need to randomize that's an important feature in any experiment especially in the wild out there in nature where lots of other things have already happened before you walked out there and you need to try to account for that by using randomizations in an uncontrolled experiment becomes really important all right so randomization is something that's really easy it's not hard to do this there are random number tables out there you can do it on your phone I looked it up you can find these apps on Google Play and Apple Excel will give you random numbers there are everywhere there are random number generators and it's really simple to try to designate lists of random numbers that you can use to pick 
I'm choosing pot 8 first, then pot 0, then pot 9, then pot 4. Next I'm choosing pot 2, then pot 5. I already chose 2, I already chose 5, etc. So you go through the random numbers to try to pick out which ones you pluck and use in random order. Okay? So there's lots of ways to get random number generators and choose random directions, choose random sets, random distances, you name it. It's fundamental and easy, so don't forget to randomize when you're doing your experiments, okay? And I mean really truly random. There's a big distinction between random and arbitrary. There's many times where we kind of wish we were doing something and called it random, and it's not actually, okay? If you turn out to be doing something arbitrarily, you can be accused later of not actually doing it randomly, okay? So here's Dilbert saying he didn't actually have numbers, so he picked a number, and um, he said that it's just, just as good as any other number, and so when challenged, he picks another number out of the air. Those kinds of arguments, based on arbitrary numbers, obviously can be perceived as somewhat false, okay? So you want to be careful about how you choose things at random, okay? There really are lots of different ways to do random. Um, you can even generate these random patterns. Um, a great place to look for random number generators and random uh, calculations is a place called random.org. Um, it even has a phone app like the other places. Random.org gives you lots of capabilities to calculate random numbers. For example, let's imagine you have 48 plants in pots. You randomly assign them to six fertilizer treatments. You getting tired of fertilizers yet? So we have zero through high different levels of fertilizer. I could use this random gener that on number generator at random.org to pick out which pots go into which treatments. So let's say there's pot 15, 37, etc. And I assign that list right there to treatment 1. That next line would be treatment 2, etc. So I go through my pots, I find pot 15, and that one goes into treatment 1. Pot 37 goes into treatment 1. I'm really truly assigning my pots of plants at random to my treatments. Okay. So, those four major features, carefully controlled conditions, having experimental controls, co sorry, comparison to your treatments, replication, multiple units, in other words, assigned at random to treatments, and that randomization. Those are the four main features of what makes an experiment, okay? You could argue, in the absence of any of those four conditions, you haven't actually conducted a good experiment. You might claim it's an experiment, but some people would say no. That's not an experiment. So we use the word experiment quite often, don't we? We could argue, for example, that this long-term mapped out pattern of fragmentation of forests, this was actually from Wisconsin, I believe, southern Wisconsin, in 1831, this is really based on a real map, um, all the way up through 1950, was an experiment. You could say that this pattern of deforestation is an experiment, or human population growth has been con considered an experiment. Well we should be careful about that. We should call it an unplanned experiment because remember you need to have carefully controlled conditions, you need to have replication, you don't have a treatment group to, that you can call it an experimental control, and this wasn't randomized. I would say yes, those are changes that are transpiring through time, but it's an unplanned experiment. There's not really the features that we would require to call it a true experiment. Okay? So it's almost like saying theory with a capital T versus a lowercase t. The word experiment gets used fairly loosely, and I would prefer that we were more strict about what constitutes an actual experiment. Okay, so let's see what makes it not an experiment then. I would say if something occurs long term, over the course of more than one career, for instance, because it's rare to find an experiment that's been going on beyond one person's ability to conduct it. There are a few of those examples, but they're pretty rare. If it only has one reference site, uh, you're only using one place to compare to another place. It's not fully replicated. If it's a case study, we see that a lot in medicine. I follow this one patient through their treatment, the experimental drug worked, I reported on their results. Okay, Those kinds of things might be considered um, not actually experiments. If it's, in other words, lacking carefully controlled conditions, you don't have multiple controls, in other words, it's not replicated controls, and if it hasn't been a randomized kind of study design. Okay? So, can we use experimental analyses? Analyses that are really truly designed
for those agricultural plot type simple worlds. If I'm going to look at deforestation patterns across a forest and each of those plots being clear cut, can I think of those as independent replicates? Well, they're on different slopes, different aspects, uh, different soils perhaps, maybe they're even different patches of different types of forest. Is it truly fair to say that they were otherwise identical replicates? That's something you have to wrestle with if you do one of these studies. Can we consider each one of these jurisdictional areas in here uh, independent replicates for the purposes of an experiment? If we mapped out fragmentation and we treated these as experiments, imagine, for example, we treat countries as treatments because they have different policies. Can we say that each of these jurisdictional maps inside of a country counts as a replicate within that treatment? they're not really randomized are they? So there's a lot of times when we want to do experimental analyses for these large-scale kinds of systems that are not actually truly planned communities. So yeah you can do these experimental analyses. You can think about an analysis of variance for instance in a setting like this or in a setting like this but you have to really remember it's an unplanned experiment and therefore you have to be a little bit cautious about how to interpret those results. You can't just assume that all those experimental conditions that you require for experimental analysis actually apply. Okay, so remember these four points. Carefully controlled conditions, experimental controls, replication, and randomization. In the absence of those, it's really difficult to say that we truly have an experiment. It might be an experiment-ish type of setting in which we have these kinds of conditions and we can apply experimental analyses, but it's not actually an experiment in that we didn't make something happen. Okay, So we have to think about planned versus unplanned experiments and those four features of a good experiment. Some of those four features might carry forward into an unplanned experiment, but often it's pretty carefully um, danced around <laughs> on whether or not those really truly did happen. A lot of people don't dwell on that and that's where there's a lot of stuff that's published out there that you might read and say yeah I don't know if I buy that largely because of these kinds of problems in experimental design and analysis. Okay so I'm going to stop there for now. The next recording gets into basic experimental designs. There's a bunch of different steps in there that will take a little while and then we'll try to come back to think about that overlap between design and analysis. In fact, they go together hand in hand. All right, so talk to you at the next one. Bye.